happening in WMO right now because a lot is going on even during this COVID situation. So this presentation is a little bit uh, about what is uh, happening here. And uh, to talk about that, I want to go back in history. And of course, most of you will be available, will be well aware about that. But I think it's important to, to look at the history to understand why we are going through a reform process in WMO. And for that, it's uh, good to recall that WMO is one of the oldest international organizations established in the world. So it was back in the 19th century, 1879, that uh, WMO was established. And at that time, it was called International Meteorological Organization, IMO. And after World War II, when the UN system was set up, the IMO engaged in discussions with the United Nations. And so in 1950, IMO changed its name to World Meteorological Organizations, World Meteorological Organization, and then through an agreement with the United Nations became a specialized agency of the United Nations. This was in 1951. And since then, WMO is the UN specialized agency uh, responsible for everything related to weather, climate, water, and environmental services. On my slides, always on the bottom, I have links so you can find more information about what's on that slide through those links. Now, to, to look at WMO in the context of the UN, it's, uh, it's, it's important to understand when we talk about the UN, we typically think about Security Council or General Assembly. But actually, the United Nations is a system of organizations, entities, funds, programs, as you can see here. And I've marked the place of WMO. So WMO is one line in this big chart. Actually, of all these organizations, there are around more than 30 organizations that are involved in space-related work. And in the UN, there is even a space coordination mechanism. It's called UN Space that meets annually and also issues a report of the Secretary General of the UN on space-related activities. But just to show here that, that we are one piece in a larger system of the United Nations. And of course, the goal of the United Nations is to build a peaceful, better, social, more just world that's sustainable. And uh, presently, this goal to build a better world is um, enshrined in what we call the Global Sustainable Development Agendas or the Global Development Agendas. Uh, a major piece in those global development agendas is the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and I'm sure you're familiar with that. It's based on 17 Sustainable Development Goals that were uh, basically declared in the year 2015. And member states of the UN have committed to fully implement those goals. And basically those goals tell us uh, what needs to be done by the year 2030 to build a peaceful, just, more social, sustainable world. And all the UN entities, they use these global development agendas to coordinate the work. And so WMO contributes actually to 12 out of the 17 SDGs and together with the United Nations Environment Program, we are co-custodian of Sustainable Development Goals 13 on climate action. Now, what has this to do with, with our role with satellites, with space? And they also go back uh, into history, and that's the beginning of the space age, the launch of the first satellite, Sputnik 1957. And the UN was also very much involved right from the start of the space age with this. So in the year 1958, just one year after the launch of Sputnik, the UN General Assembly decided to establish a special committee dealing with space-related questions. And that's the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, UN COPUS. And this body remains one of the largest committees in the United Nations system and meets annually three times a year to discuss matters related to the peaceful use of outer space. Now, since WMO was already a specialized agency of the UN in the year 1958, it also joined the meetings of the Committee on the Peaceful Use of Outer Space. And when the committee met, it gave a task to WMO. And uh, the task that came both uh, from United States and USSR, and you, you see a citation here of US President John F. Kennedy, who proposed that there should be cooperative efforts between all nations on weather prediction and <laughs> eventually, interestingly, on weather control, making use of space-based observations. And so the WMO at this meeting of COPOS, at one of the first meetings, was asked to come back with a proposal on how to use satellites 
for better weather predictions because it was understood that better weather predictions could avert help to uh, mitigate disasters and, and that would be useful for the development of many countries. And WMO, in response to this request, came back with a proposal, and that's the famous World Weather Watch. And the World Weather Watch became operational from 1967. And it's, it's one of the best examples of international collaboration, utilizing space assets or satellites in space and uh, to, to really provide better weather forecasts. Now, uh, the original proposal for this World Weather Watch is the famous wechsler bugayev report, uh, called after the names of the scientists uh, who were heading the drafting of this report. You can actually download this report from the uh, WMO library, and then it's a fascinating read. So this World Weather Watch in the 1960s, it was understood uh, what was necessary to provide good weather forecasts. So first of all, you need a global observing system consisting of space and surface space systems. Then you need a telecommunication system to actually disseminate the data at that time, basically based on fax machines or telex machines. And then you need global data processing and forecasting systems or so computer centers where you analyze the data. So these were the core elements of the World Weather Watch in the 1960s. And that really worked out very well. And uh, today, of course, this is the basis for our weather forecasts for climate uh, monitoring climate predictions. Over the years, this global observing system, the space-based component and also the surface-based component, they've evolved. So initially, we just had two satellites in the 1960s. And as of this year, we have around 200 satellites that contribute to the space-based component of the global observing system. And the global observing system is actually now evolving into what we call the VIGOS, the WMO integrated global observing system. So the major difference here is that the GOS was basically focused on weather prediction, but VIGOS is focused on about 14 WMO application areas, including applications for marine, oceans, for air navigation, air quality, climate monitoring, space weather. So it's a much, much wider framework that we have. It just also shows us how, how VIGOS is happening. So you see, we have two major developments. On one hand, we have this global development agenda, the big challenges to humankind. And UN Secretary General actually he said that sustainable development is the biggest challenge to humankind that humankind has ever faced. And on the other hand, we have technology that's evolving, better satellites, better computers. That's reflected by our move towards Zweigos. Now, WMO is still the old organization, basically, from the 19th century, and it was a little bit updated in the 1950s when we moved to the UN. So our executive, um, they analyzed the situation and they said, with all these challenges, with all these developments, you know, it's time to update WMO as well. And so they started out with proposals already a few years back for a WMO governance reform to make WMO more fit to face those challenges. And last year, we had the so-called 18th World Meteorological Congress. So every four years, we have such a Congress, and it's the supreme decision-making body of WMO. And at this Congress, the WMO governance reform was approved. Now, this picture here shows you what's, what's at the core of the governance reform. I mean, basically, with WMO established in the 19th century, over the decades, WMO grew and you know, our work was reflected in different commissions. We had eight different commissions. We had many meetings, many interfaces, and it was found that this was not very efficient and also very costly. So one core aspect of the WMO governance reform is to reduce the number of commissions from eight to two. And you can see this on the slide. We have here an infrastructure commission and the services commission. And those commissions, they tie the WMO members that I take the core of the governance reform with the global development agendas. And the global development agendas you have on the outside of the circle. So you can see the three global development agendas, which are the sustainable development, it's the 2030 agenda. You can see the Paris Climate Change Agreement, this is mitigation and adaptation. And you can see the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. And at the core are really the members, because when these global development agendas were established, the members said, it's not the United Nations who will implement this, it's we, the members, we commit to successfully do this. But the 
United Nations, including WMO, are of course called upon to support the members in implementing these global development agendas. And, and you also see on this slide, we have a, a new body, and that's the research board on weather, climate, water, and the environment. And that research board has the task to ensure that the latest scientific findings and technical developments are timely brought to the attention of WMO members and integrated into our operational work. So it looks very simple on this chart. Uh, on my next slide, I show you that this is where we are today. So in, in practice, it's not that easy. So you, you still have the two commissions, but you have a lot of sub bodies. And what's happening or what has been happening the last few months and weeks is to set up the sub bodies. So your permanent representatives all in January of this year received letters to nominate possible co-chairs for these different bodies. And uh, hopefully you have also been contacted about these opportunities and we have received from many WMO members nominations. And basically two weeks ago, the Infrastructure Commission and the Services Commission have been established and some committees below this. So there's a committee on observations, a committee on, on data, and the co-chairs uh, for these committees have also been decided. And all the co-chairs together, they form a so-called management group. So we have an infrastructure management group, a services management group, and they are now going to finalize the membership of the different commissions and committees. And then under these committees, we will establish expert teams and that will include expert teams related also to this space-based uh, observing system. So this is where we are today and the latest updates you can find on the link below here. And there you can also find the terms of reference of the Infrastructure Commission of the Services Commission and its substructures. So if you want to know about what's going on in WMO, this is a really good read. And uh, yeah, you will really know the, the latest about what's going on. Now, the work of WMO over the next few years will be driven by the WMO strategic plan for the year 2020 to 2023. And uh, that plan uh, is guided by the so-called Vision 2030 that's aligned to the 2030 agenda. And uh, basically, we envision a world where all countries, where all WMO members have the observations, the tools, the capabilities to face, to implement these global development agendas. And we want to assure that best possible services are be provided, uh, whether over land, at sea, or in the air. And uh, I always add here, and in from space. There are different long-term plans uh, in the uh, strategic plan. Uh, our work is very much focused on uh, long-term goal number two infrastructures, but uh, your work in particular, VLAB, of course, that's also related to uh, item four here, member services. So this is capacity building. O overall, our work addresses all of these aspects here. Again, if you want to have more details, if you want to learn more about the strategic, strategic plan, it's a short document, it's a good read. Uh, you can download this from the WMO library. So now coming to the space program. So we have been around since the year 2003 and the last time our work has been reviewed by Congress was in 2011. And we have made four main components in our work. So there's a space-based observing system. That's the work that we do with our partners in CGMS and CEOs. And, and you see we have about 200 satellites, more satellites than ever, more capable, and um, many more satellites will be coming in the coming years. So I think this uh, this is something that's very much under, under control and uh, it's kind of the golden time for space-based observations. But with all the data, if you don't get the data into the hands of users, uh, it, it will not be very helpful. So we also have an element that's related to access to satellite data and products. And it's also working out well because internet is becoming better all over the world. Ground stations are becoming cheaper. So it is it is easy. It's not, not no longer a big hurdle to get the data into users' hands. Where we are still facing a lot of uh, uh, challenges is the capacity building aspect, awareness and training. And this is where you come into play. So we have a situation where many countries now have the data um, and maybe they also have the, the infrastructure to work on the data, but they also need to have the capability. They need to have trained people, people who stay on, that are being retained, uh, people that can grow, a knowledge that can be passed on so that this data can be transferred into information and this can be 
transferred into societal benefits that address the global development agendas and their implementation. And then a fourth aspect was added a few years ago, um, I think also around 2010, 2011, that space weather coordination. And space weather is so important for us because uh, it, um, uh, it, inf it impacts the assets in space. So space weather could uh, detrimentally affect our infrastructure. And if we lose that, that would, of course, uh, impact all the other aspects of our work. But then it also has a future aspect. I mean, we have astronauts on a space station. We will send astronauts beyond the protecting uh, one Allen belts. And, and so we need to know about space weather. And, and that's an ongoing activity for, for today and for the future. What's important is that in the space program, we, we looked in the past at the work of the space program uh, using this uh, space program value chain. Uh, so you have on the left side here on this chart, the satellite operators. So with the satellites, where the data is coming from, on the right side, you have the users. Users can be you and me, so citizens that get information on air quality, on climate change, on disaster warnings, on the weather, on agriculture, drought, uh, floods, and so on. Can also be policy decision makers. And this is where societal benefits accrue if the right information is passed to users and users know how to act upon this information. But this will not work if there is any break in this value chain between the satellites on the left side and the users on the right side. So we have to be very careful that this chain is being continued. And a very important aspect in the chain is exactly the awareness and the training. And, and that's what you're doing through the VLAP. So you have a very essential role because all the money we spend on the satellites, on the calibration, on quality control, on the data dissemination networks, it will be wasted if it then doesn't um, come to fruition with the users. So you have a very, very important role in this chain. Um, now, Important here uh, on the bottom of the slide here, I show you the URL of the WMO Space Program website. We have two websites. We have one website, the so-called community websites, uh, and, and that's this URL here. This is kind of information about our meetings. Uh, it's, it's more for experts. It's more for people like you who are in the field. And then we also have a public website with program information on what the WMO is doing in the space-based field. That's kind of complementary, but it's also more for the public. So on the public website, we have information about our latest publications. And you can see here, we, ha we have published uh, earlier this year the vision for the WMO Integrated Global Observing System in 2040. So this is our vision for what kind of satellites and surface-based systems we want to have in place in 2040 to meet global development agendas. And uh, just a few weeks ago, we published uh, a regional data survey of our satellite data requirements group in regional association two and five. So this is also relevant uh, for the attendees of this meeting. And you may wish to download uh, these uh, publications. And most WMO publications these days are available only electronically, so not in printing. So coming to the next one, uh, I want to come back to the beginning of my presentation. So I talked about the global development agendas and uh, I, I worked for some time in UNS Cup in Bangkok. Uh, so working on the regional space applications program of the United Nations Social and Economic Commission for Asia and the Pacific. And what's so nice about UNS Cup is that they have a statistical division that's very skillful. That's actually every year publishing a report on how well we, long we are with achieving the sustainable development goals. So they collect the data and you can see that the latest publication just came out a few weeks ago. That's the SDG implementation status for the year 2019. And you can see this interesting line here uh, that symbolizes 2019 and you can see the blue boxes. And you can see we are not presently in Asia and the Pacific achieving a single sustainable development goal, not one. We are not on time. And actually, when you look at sustainable development goal number 12 and 13, and it's in particular climate action here, we are actually moving backwards. So our situation is uh, getting worse than it was uh, in the beginning of 2000. So you see it's very challenging and Asia Pacific is, uh, you know, it's probably not different in other regions of the world. 
So we have a very challenging situation. And what is more, even more distressing for me is that the statistical division in UNS Cup, you know, these sustainable development goals can be uh, split up into two, into three different categories. So we have indicators under the SDGs for economic goals, for social goals, and for environmental goals. So social, economic, and environmental indicators. Interestingly, most data we have for economic indicators, because when countries exchange and trade with each other, the data is usually being known. For social data, we have social indicators, we have less data because many countries are not willing to share the data. But interestingly, the least amount of data we have for environmental data. And for me, that's a big surprise because we as space community, we are exactly taking the environmental data, but that shows us our environmental data is not reaching where it should be. So that also shows me we have a big gap in capacity building and there's a lot of work for us still to be done. And uh, we have a lot of discussion also in the CEO's working group capacity development. We have uh, a, a space capacity development board there and we are trying to make this important link between our data, between the statistical divisions, for example, in UNS Cup, to ensure that they have the data to assess our progress towards sustainable development goals. So, and then I come to my last slide with conclusions. And uh, that basically it's just to reiterate how we manage weather, climate and water issues that will determine our future. It will determine if we will have conflicts on our planet, if we can have build a just world, socially just world, if we can maintain our environment. So WMO has, has an absolutely important role in WMO members and, and all of us who are working in that field. The World Weather Watch of the 1960s 60s has been an absolute success story of international cooperation, of sharing space and other benefits. And we are progressing on that. The technical side is not the problem. We are getting better satellites, better computer systems. GOS is evolving into VIGOS. And from the meteorologic, meta, weather-based World Weather Watch, we are moving towards an observing system, supporting what we call the WMO Earth system approach. For us, a space-based observing system community, it's, I think, most important that we ensure that these valuable assets that cost billions of dollars are fully utilized to help achieve the goals set out in global development agendas. And this is where your work is so important. So VLAP capacity building efforts are absolutely essential in that. And, and we need to continue. We need to upscale to make sure we can build this better world that we envision. And that concludes my presentation. So thank you very much for your attention.